Before we begin, I want to welcome Father Michael Shields visiting us from the Diocese of Anchorage in Alaska. He likes the weather here, he says. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary of a Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Let us pray. May your people exult forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter said to the people, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death, but God raised him from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. 
Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments are liars, and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is truly perfected in him. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Back before Lent, I began a series of sermons on the moral life of the church and uh, discontinued that when we got to Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter. Now we're back on track. And we were getting up to the commandments, the law of God. And we're in the second tablet that regulates our social relationships, our relationships with others. The first three are about our relationship with God. And the fourth commandment is honor thy father and thy mother. 
And the Sunday before Palm Sunday, I got to the part of the parents, of the children's duties towards their parents, to, uh, to, to love them, to uh, honor them, and to obey them. And the, old, the first two last through life. The last line of obedience ends with uh, emancipation of adult, in adulthood. So, and I promised then, and the children were very happy, I said, now the next time I'm going to talk about the duties of parents towards their children. And so that's the subject today. And this uh, goes to the catechism of the church, that the richness of conjugal life cannot be reduced solely to the procreation of children. It must extend to their moral education and spiritual formation. So this brings out the role of the parents as educators and the ability of education for their children. Not the government, the parents do. And the first, we mean the most important a role of educating, and, and also we mean the earliest in time. You are teaching your children uh, from the very beginning, from the infancy, before they ever get to a school or anything, they're learning a lot by example. They're watching and learning. And uh, this is brought out in the infant baptism when the parents are said, it will be your duty to bring the child up to keep God's commandments by loving God and neighbor. Do you clearly understand what you're undertaking? And the parents says, I do, before the child's baptized. So regarding the uh, education, the catechism also points out that the first step is creating a home where tenderness, forgiveness, respect, fidelity, and disinterested service are the rule. The home, it says, is the place for education in the virtues. You're not going to get that in a school, a public school, or, or, or outside the home. This requires an apprenticeship. And that's an interesting word. We know the analogy of someone's learning a craft from a master. There's a master worker, and then there's the apprentice who learns from him. And uh, basically, the saying is the, uh, the, the parent is the master relate to authority. They live under the authority of God. They exercise authority over their children. They call their children to task when the children are disobedient or defiant. One of the ways in which this is done in, in forming children is uh, the Sunday Mass. And we have a wonderful example of uh, parents when they say, for example, okay, y'all want to go to the beach tomorrow? All right, well, we're going to go to the Vigil Mass Saturday night, we're going to, or we're going to go to the 8 a.m., uh, but we're going to get that priority. And we're, going to, we, uh, we're under the authority of God, we parents, and the children are under the authority of the parents. And the Catechism goes on to say, the home is the natural environment for initiating a human being into solidarity and communal responsibilities. But that simply, it's in the home where people first learn to live with others. Now, most of us, many of us at least, have siblings. I had six, okay? And you know that thing about the sibling rivalry and all that? They're socializing each other. They're teaching how to live with each other. And uh, that's one, one of the things that happens in the home. Also, from the Catechism, quoting the Second Vatican Council, parents receive the responsibility and privilege of evangelizing their children. Parents should initiate the children at an early age into the mysteries of the faith, of which they are the first heralds to their children. They should associate them from their tenderest years with the life of the church. And again, Sunday Mass is a big part of that. And I encourage parents, uh, Talk about the Mass. Use the Missalettes. There's a lot of good commentary in there about various feasts and the seasons of the year. The readings are in the Missalettes. Um, and, and you can look at that you know, before Mass and talk about it. And um, the preparation and, and sometimes maybe should start on Saturday evening, especially if there's a rush on Sunday morning. And laying out the clothes. What are we going to wear for Mass tomorrow? And uh, maybe talk about the upcoming Sunday celebration. And we know that in, uh, since COVID, you know, we'll have a lot of online giving and support, but the ritual of the envelope is an, uh, important. And maybe children sometimes can uh, uh, include their little offering in the envelope, or even a note, what they did for someone that week that they would be offered to God with their parents' uh, offertory. Conversation to and from church is important, uh, especially going home. You could talk about the homily. 
It's so easy to just be negative, you know. Well, it was too hot. The priest had all those windows open and no air conditioning. Or it was too cold. It was a breeze coming. It's easy to criticize. But to uh, talk about what, what did Father say? Did, what, did you hear something? What, what do you think of any Christian before going to bed at night? It's a longstanding spiritual tradition. Um, in the sacred times of the year, liturgical seasons, celebrating those. A lot of cultures have special foods to celebrate, like Easter foods and Lenten foods and all of those things. Very, very important. Prayer at home, prayer for the family, the friends, the world, the church, prayers of praise, prayers of silence, prayers of thanks, and sacramentals in the home. We are a sacramental people. And as um, one parishioner pointed out to me years ago, your interior designer is not going to put a crucifix on the wall or statues or holy pictures in the house. You and parents need to do that. Since walk into a home, walk into your home, say, is there anything that a stranger walking into this house will see that will identify this as a home of believers? Is there something there? Let the children see those things. Let them connect the home, what's going on in the home with what we're doing here in this sacramental setting. The, uh, the area I also want to talk about is um, not in the catechism, and I wanted to just mention a few things going on in the culture. And when I do that, I always like to say, this is not church teaching, this isn't from the catechism, take it or leave it, okay? But we know that there's a lot of concerns about our youngest generation today. A lot of this comes from podcasts that I listen to. And the current concerns for the mental health of our children is that we see signs like anxiety, depression, a lack of agency, which means uh, an unwillingness to act without talking to a, a parent or something, uh, young adults I'm talking about, very hesitant to act, family alienation, uh, these are some of the problems. And the, statistically, we, say, we are told there are more mental health interventions for young people today than in any previous generation. So what's, what is going on? And two major explanations, probably nobody has the full story, one we've talked about is social media. And the uptick and the incidence of depression and anxiety in this age group began about the time the smartphone became commonly available. And that, of course, puts people in social media, which, uh, you know, the Internet has a lot of good material, a lot of good Catholic material on the Internet, but there are also problems. And one is social media. Uh, young girls, as I said, are especially prone to this. Uh, in adolescents, <clears throat> they're changing, they're growing from little girls into young women. They're very conscious of their appearance, and, uh, and there's a lot of uh, bullying on uh, social media. Uh, there are apps where people actually get to change their appearance of their selves, to put it out there, and social media, it's fake. It's a fake uh, community. It's not a real social community. Uh, and as I said, there's online bullying, there's predators. There are a lot of things that are evil that are going on in the social media. So that is part of the problem. That needs to be controlled. The other one, more recently, I'm reading and hearing people talk about um, bad therapy. Now, I'm not opposed to therapy. I recommend people get it. If you can get a good therapist, that's a great find, and some people need that. But bad, there are some that are not good therapists, and then any good therapist would relay, you gotta have a, an identity with that person. Just does it, if, it, if you don't connect with a therapist, doesn't mean they're bad, just means you don't connect. But the greater problem that some are writing about is that too many people, people who are well, are going into therapy, and there's always dangers when somebody's well and they enter in a medical treatment. One, one author gave the example, if you get a bruise, they don't admit you to the hospital. You might pick up germs and viruses and everything in the hospital. And there are some uh, problems that can be introduced with therapy. And even the schools, you know, are turning to that, bringing in mass groups of therapists. And um, the, uh, one of the authors talked about you know, parents today are getting the idea that, well, they have to be therapists. Well, I think parenting does involve some therapy. Um, but uh, in, instead of talking about what did you do, it's like, how do you feel about that and feel like they have to take on that role? And um, my parishioners are going to know where I'm going to go next because, again, there were seven of us growing up. And my mother didn't really have time for a lot of that. And so uh, it wasn't uh, one of the, she had many sayings, I'm sure yours do too. But my favorite and greatest of all, you wanna cry? You wanna cry? I'll give you something to cry about, okay? <laughs> really concerned about feelings. It wasn't about feelings. It was like, okay, 
What are you doing? And one of the dangers is they say with therapy for people who really don't need it is that our diagnosis can become reified. And by reified means it can be made into a thing. And even in this research, this one author interviewing some parents, they are identifying their children by their diagnosis. Oh, that's my OCD one. My ADHD one is upstairs. You know, they're even identifying their own children by the diagnosis. And then there's very difficult and very uh, damaging um, so sort of psychological, social contagion of this whole gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria exists. It's, rare. It, it's real, but it's very, very rare. And it is being introduced into people's minds. They're going through that whole tr transition in adolescence, and 80% of the people who have some of that, it, it, it solves itself by the time they get to young adulthood. But instead, the people are being told they're all oh, they're gender dysphoric, and this is being done within one or two therapy sessions. Jordan Peterson says it would take two years of intense psychotherapy and counseling to come to a valid conclusion, and so they're being just identified and going into treatment that's harmful, and yada yada. You know the rest of the story, and um, the uh, positive side. So what are parents called to do? for their children. Be leaders. The late Rabbi Edwin Friedman wrote about leadership, and he had a phrase I've quoted many times. The good leader is connected, but apart from the group. As a parent, that means you know what's going on with your child, who they're hanging out with, what they're doing, where they're going, whether they have homework or not. Your parent is connected with the group, but also apart. The parent is willing to take a stand that might not be popular. We know that about leadership. It's lonely at the top sometimes. And it might not feel good, but the parent has to be the parent. You can't always be the friend. And, and we, we see that as a problem. You have God-given authority as parents. Exercise it. The children know you have it. And, and, and when you exercise your God-given authority and you have order in your home, then you give the children a predictable ways of acting. And they need that. We all need it. And one of the greatest challenges for, in education is a, does a child feel safe in the school? If a child doesn't feel safe, they're not going to learn. They have to be safe. And so a home with predictable ways of acting, rules, consequences, and challenges, leadership, all of that is important to children. Allow them to take age-appropriate risk. Now, no parent wants their child in danger. But uh, one of the things of lack of agency is uh, one of the people interviewed is a PhD taught very bright students. Her students were all PhDs. But even as young adults starting their career, give them uh, age-appropriate uh, uh, levels of, of, of letting out on their own. You know, growing up on Sullivan's Island, it was pretty safe. You just left home on your bicycle in the morning in the summer. Uh, when the siren blew at noon at the fire department, you came home for lunch, and you come back when the lights came on at night. Very safe environment. But let them take age-appropriate risks, going over to a friend's house on their own or something like that. Control the social media. You're the parent, and it's your duty to control that. See, social media, we know how powerful it is, very powerful. So in your home, if you have control over that, you, wow, you really got power. You, got, you are the parent. You're, you've got the authority. Teach and show respect for other people within the family, with, and people outside the family. Celebrate their accomplishments. Obviously, we all re need reinforcement on our good things. Have a schedule. This is bedtime. This is the time to do homework. This is the time we get up in the morning. Prayer and sacramentals in the home I've already mentioned. I'd like to wrap it up by going to something that um, I've said, uh, quoting Father Groeschel over the years, the late Father Benedict Groeschel. But also, I want to quote the Second Vatican Council, which also said, that while parents contribute to the holiness of their children, children contribute to the holiness of their parents. And that is true. In the priesthood, we learn this. We call it a pastoral moment when young people begin to have children. There are two, you know, it's not uncommon for people to slip away from the practice of the faith in adolescence, early adulthood. One big pastoral moment is marriage. They're making commitments. They're getting responsible. The second big pastoral moment is the birth of the first child. Parents will do things for their children that they won't bother to do for themselves. They'll come to church, they'll get in the parish, as they see the chaos and dissolution in the culture. 
and they, they want the order the, and, and all the things that come from faith. But what Father Benedict Rochelle was talking to a group of parents, and he's talking about his religious life. He's a vowed religious Franciscan. And so he had taken solemn vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. He said to the parents, don't feel any less spiritual because you haven't taken the vow of poverty. You live it. And in fact, he was saying, if you have children, you're living the vow of poverty because he said, they will take it all. They'll take everything you have, all your material possessions, all of your time, all of your thoughts, all of your heart. You are living the vow of poverty whether you've taken it or not. So to the commandment of God, honor thy father and thy mother, we can add these thoughts too, honor thy children. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, and for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the world to come. Amen. In the name of the risen Christ, we present our petitions with confidence. That the church may work tirelessly to give witness to the glory of the resurrection, let us pray to the Lord that world leaders and all people will strive to promote the dignity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for an end to violence and into killing, for a respect for the sacredness of innocent human life everywhere, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for all who serve our country's armed forces, especially those in the way of harm, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the sick who seek God's healing graces, for all who are struggling with addictions, let us pray to the Lord. Father, to these petitions we join thanks for the blessings of the week to spend. We invoke your blessing on the week to come as we offer all these prayers through Christ our Lord.
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Father Almighty. Receive, O Lord, we pray, these offerings of your exultant church. And as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in perpetual happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. By the oblation of his body, he brought the sacrifices of old to fulfillment in the reality of the cross. By commending himself to you for our salvation, showed himself the priest, the altar, and the lamb of sacrifice. And therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise. Even the heavenly power, bring together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, unto you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, Jock, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. May we merit to be co-heirs to eternal life. May praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. 
through him and with him and in him. O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Inside the rail here on, on this side, okay? Body of Christ. 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 Good 
body of Christ. 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 Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Open your mouth. Put out your tongue. Stick, stick it out farther. Good. Good. Body of Christ. 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 of Christ, body 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 of Christ,
body of Christ. Let us pray. Look with kindness upon your people, O Lord, and grant, we pray, that those you were pleased to renew by eternal mysteries may flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended.
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Hail, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, for vanish, for them to thee. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this veil of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, denies our mercy towards us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy Lord Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down with favor upon thy people who cry to thee. And by the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of St. Joseph, her spouse, of thy blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, mercifully and graciously hear the prayers which we pour forth for the conversion of sinners, for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother, the Church, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, Defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And to thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, for the power of God, thrust down into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who run through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus. Most